thank you very much, uh, Maxime, for the uh, opening and, and for the organizers in general for the kind of invitation. And I'm very happy to present to you today some work in progress with Spoiler Daniel Yes, who will speak next, and with Norm Zeilberger, and which is in turn, oh, thank you, <laughs> much better, uh, which is in turn uh, based on prior work with Ross Hammer and John Krivin, for which there's already a preprint uh, uh, available. Um, and so the, the general motivation for this work is to find a formalization of certain aspects of a writing theory. And, and the idea here is for a writing theory, in the simplest case, you, you just have uh, uh, configurations modeled by discrete graph or finite sets. And then transformations look like you, you take out a certain number of elements, put in uh, other elements, and that would be a transition. This looks very, very basic, but it's already powerful enough then if you put some semantics in, for example, chemical reaction systems. But uh, nowadays, in particular, um, there's a lot of work on, on modeling, for example, the <laughs> spread of disease models. Um, actually, there's a team in, in uh, London School of Health, and whatever they're called, sorry. But I mean, uh, William Waits and colleagues, say, for example, have built a very successful COVID model. So it's a, if you have a network, and on the network you have nodes which can be either, let's say, susceptible or infected, then you might have a little transformation which picks such a configuration and makes one transition where then some, somebody gets infected. And then, of course, you want to study the evolution of such uh, configurations. And there's an, a very nice, I mean, going more, more Baroque, uh, the last, uh, well, it was not the last cup, but the last cup in person, I think, cup 2019, uh, Timmy Kislev presented a very nice type of rule where you take a graph, you pick a vertex <coughs> that has certain numbers of in and out going uh, edges, then you clone this vertex and add another edge so that they are linked. Um, and you repartition the original in and outgoing edges in such a way that, of course, the overall numbers match. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, a very nice way. I, I think, if I understood correctly, it's related to Konservish graph homology in some way. Um, but it's just to show the variety of types of things you can encounter in your writing. And what is very nice is that, uh, from a formal standpoint, um, all of these examples, in fact, um, are instances which you can model through what is called double push-out semantics. So an individual writing step from some original configuration X to some R alpha of X through some rule um, is modeled through such a commutative diagram where both of the squares are pushouts. And of course you have to ask some properties of the underlying categories, but all of these three cases, for example, fall into the scope. And um, I must say that, anyways, so in particular for this um, case uh, Atemi showed, I mean, we, we didn't know in the literature how to do this as double push out writing, but I mean, with Russ Hammer and Jean Crevin, we developed how to do it. And it's actually a very nice example, which pushed us towards this work. Um, so thanks a lot, Atemi. <laughs> um, and now the, the main point is, as I already alluded to, in most cases, it's one thing to really formally define what you mean by a writing. So, I mean, if you want to do an algorithm, there should be one base implementation, which maybe is done in category theory. But then most of the times you're interested in doing more with it. And in particular, maybe you want to do combinatorics. And here, here there's this interesting aspect that in combinatorial species theory, you have this intuition that for each species, you can associate a generating function, which is some formal power series. On this formal power series, you have differential operators just I mean, the ordinary multiplication is from a variable and derivative. And the idea here is that the monomials x to the n, if you just have one formal variable, form a vector space, and you can generate each monomial, obviously, by <coughs> acting with multiplication operator. But the more interesting thing in terms of rewriting is this observation that if you act with, you know, some d by dx to the uh, q, followed by multiplication to the p on an x to the n, you get a combinatorial prefactor which has uh, um, actual interpretation. It's a non-negative integer coefficient, and it counts exactly the number of ways you can take out q elements from a set of n, you know, if you don't regard the order. And now if you look back at this original, very simple example of just set rewriting, indeed uh, this operator d by dx to the 2 followed by x hat um, is exactly implementing the number of ways to take out two elements, for example, from a set. So that is, that is the first observation. And the second is that if you if you, I mean, these operators themselves have an algebraic structure, which again has a combinatorial interpretation. Namely, if you now think that a uh, operator d by dx to the r, oh, sorry, I think it's s there, followed by x hat to the r, that is taking out s elements and then putting in r, and then d by dx to the q, followed by x hat to the p, is taking out q elements and then p. These two procedures can interact because some elements you take out in the second operation of taking out might be produced by the middle. And so this coefficient here is exactly the number of ways you could have had an interaction between the two steps. Again, 
looking at sets without order. And so the big question for us was for actually almost seven, eight years now, well, it is nice to have this double Fouchard semantics, but that is intrinsically not linked to any calculus of counting or, or doing combinatorics. And so the, the purpose of this work was to give a formal definition of what it means to define linear operators acting on some vector space over configurations. So here, uh, the idea is that somehow you should be able to give coefficients just like in the, I think in the uh, point two up there, that, that gives a number of ways you can rewrite but unfortunately, often you're only interested up to isomorphisms, for example. You're only interested uh, uh, acting on isomorphism class of graphs, say, for example. And so that poses uh, quite a number of problems. And the, the other idea is somehow the vector space itself um, <coughs> has a particular structure in all examples of interest that you can generate it by acting with certain of these linear operators on something like a vacuum state or empty configuration. And the, the most difficult point is understanding how, how do you link from this very serene definition of rewriting steps, how do you get to something like uh, combinatorial coefficients that somehow model the interactions of steps. And finally, that'll lead to um, what I call rule algebras. Um, so so all, of, all of these points uh, can be nicely covered by some <coughs> additional category theory, and I'm going to introduce it to you, of course, in now. And so sort of the key problem here is that if you think about it, this double push-out semantic is very symmetric. It's two push-out squares, yes? So push-outs, um, maybe for the not-so-category I find, it's just to say a uh, commutative square is a push-out if you have this universal property that for all enlargements of the square by a cospan into x, there exists a unique morphism that mediates and makes the whole thing commute, which means in particular that if you have two push-out squares, I mean, over the same span, with into objects D and D prime, there must be a, a universal, uh, a, a unique isomorphism mediated between the two. And of course, this is well known if you do algorithms for set rewriting, for example. Um, the union of a set is, of course, a well posed operation. It's just that if you write an algorithm, you have to, in quotation marks, name the elements of the union. And there you have a degree of freedom. And so this is exactly this, this problem. And now, if you imagine you do steps of rewrites, you, you accumulate up all of these essential uniqueness issues. Uh, and that is what one has to overcome. That is the technical, yes. Nicolas, yes. So is it something which is possibly related to the fact that there is the notion of non-ambiguity in grammars? When we say that a grammar is non-ambiguous, yeah. that's one unique way to derive the final word. Here it would be objects, but... Something like that, yeah. I, I'll show it to you because, I mean, it's a little bit counterintuitive what comes out in the end, I think, but uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so um, the goal is again, to define some way of acting on objects and counting how many ways there are to do so. And then how, if you encode that, how, how to you know, count interactions, if you will, of steps. And our approach um, with Paul, Andrea and Norm um, was, after a lot of trial and error, finally something going really formal. And, and first of all, formalizing the, the steps themselves in a suitable double category. And then, most importantly, to formalize these um, non-negative integer coefficients by a procedure of categorification. And the idea is that rather than trying to directly define this vector space and the linear operators, because we only want to reproduce linear uh, non-negative integer coefficients, we produce something like a pre-sheaf calculus, and then we take cardinalities of sets, and these cardinalities will be these integers we want to formalize. And the, the whole procedure will cover quite some nice topics in category theory. Um, I'll briefly introduce them. I, I hope it will be not too, um, too crazy. So, so, so first of all, double categories, it is very useful uh, framework, uh, I think, and there will be, for example, a virtual workshop about this all week, I think, this week also. Um, and and the, the, the main point is that a double category is somehow the, the interaction between two categories D0 which for us will be the objects we write and, and you know, some sort of monomorphism that code embeddings. And then the D1, um, the, the objects are the horizontal maps. These are the, the rules, the rewriting rules we formalize. And then the vertical, um, I mean, the, the, the two cells are the actual rewriting steps. So you see this is somehow uh, already a first hint. This might be useful. And then you have some structure. I mean, um, namely you have, uh, you can read out the horizontal source and target with functor. You can read, uh, you have an embedding of uh, vertical morphisms into two cells, uh, sort of in these horizontal identity cells. There's a vertical composition, which is just composition in the category D1. 
But the, the, the really interesting bit is the horizontal composition. Because, I mean, the main point double categories are useful is that you can somehow um, cope with a situation where one direction of composition is only um, weakly associative. Um, and so this is this horizontal composition. And in, in particular, um, because uh, horizontal composition is only weakly associative, one has to take a little bit of care with these diagrams one is going to draw. Namely, um, it's useful to fix the presentation, which is just to say you give a preferred um, order of composition for, for if you have an n-fold uh, horizontal composite, you have to tell me in which way you are going to use, uh, you're only given a two-step two composition. But okay, but this can be fixed, and so in all the diagrams that follow, we will take this convention that we have somehow fixed uh, an order of composition, so-called unbiased presentation. And you will see that in, indeed this problem arises directly from the first step in this double push-out rewriting. Simply when we paste cells, um, this amounts to this um, large diagram, and, and there's a step where you have to take pullbacks, and I mean in this moment you are no longer um, strictly associative. So basically for the double push-out rewriting, fixing the horizontal composition is part of the data, uh, and essentially it amounts to fixing chosen pullbacks that mediate the, the, the compositions. So, can be written, uh, so what categories for this rewriting one should think about? Like a mandatory object with some boundary and or, or some inclusion? Yeah, so you normally need something like an adhesive category, so you need to be able yeah, to speak... Examples, like you have like graphs with some labels, yeah. so rewriting, what the category is? The, the category is um, this pre sheaf category over, over the um, template, which is just edges and vertices with two morphisms. And then you can type it if you want, if you want um, sorts on the vertices. Oh, okay. So it's kind of abstract stuff. Yeah, so the pre yeah. yeah I think the question is uh, what are the vertical maps and the horizontal? Oh, sorry. Uh, the vertical maps will be some sort of embeddings. I mean, maybe you need to restrict to regular monomorphisms, but something like that. And the horizontal maps will be spans. And this Artemis example, for example, if you take multigraphs as the D0 category, then the spans can be arbitrary morphism and exactly can f fuse and clone vertices. That was the whole trick about this. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, being adhesive is just to make sure you have these push-outs as long as at least one morphism. And replacement in the result of inclusions. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So this is like a uh, sort of the set complement in, in set rewriting and then set union. And I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean it's abstract. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I, I'll show I'll show an example in the end more explicitly. Maybe it's just uh, I, I think the main point is this was uh, from Eric in the seventies that it's just useful to have like this generic scheme so that you then know what it, what you mean by rewriting and you don't you can reason about formal properties. So maybe you, you could <laughs> say that uh, yes, yeah, sorry, but sorry. <laughs> R if R is a rule from input to output, yeah. S will be an instance of the rule. Yeah, exactly. So you find the i and the x somehow by uh, some sort of sub-object. And then you take out everything from x which is in i but not in k. So it's like a remove some stuff, potentially. And then um, essentially with the o you glue something in. Like for example add an edge, like an Artemis rule. Oh, in your, in your rule, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, maybe I should have put some examples. I apologize. Um, I'll show an example in the end, <laughs> which is, uh, okay. Um, in any event, so, so, so now the point is we, we have a double category. We have this D1, the, 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 the rewrites, and D0, the objects. And the idea is now, the first attempt to formalize counting how many ways there are to rewrite is to define a pre sheaf over these cells. And then thinking that, um, in particular, this sort of Yoneda distribution pre sheaf where you take a rule and then you look at all ways you can apply it. That should somehow have something to do with the number of ways to count. The only problem is that because of all this, this essential uh, uniqueness, these isomorphisms, we overcount. So this, in fact, if one tries this directly, gives uh, um, combinatorial uh, spurious factors. Um, and the other point was <coughs> This, I mean, nothing in this double category so far tells us anything about the situation where you compose sort of at the foot when you do two steps in a row. Um, we are no closer at the moment than, at least at this stage, to, to count. And so the, the whole point is, one of the key ingredients is we wanted to be able to create our possible states from a vacuum, sort of. from a, And so this technically means we, we need a cut query with a strict inertial object, like for example in these multigraphs, an empty graph with some technical properties. Um, 
that is sort of, I mean, that is usually the case in all of the examples. It's a bit of a technical condition, but that is never like an, a real problem. But the, but the really difficult bit is to come up with a way of composing, I mean, getting even these commutative diagrams where you do two steps of a rewrite. How, how does this work? Wh where does this come from? And it turns out, and this is an insight by Paul André and, and, and Noam, um, that there is a generic construction in category theory called the coend. Um, and for the case we are interested in, when the functor is a so-called profunctor, as a signature C op cross C to Z, um, there is a nice formula for it, which is essentially saying, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's essentially a tag disjoint union of sets modulo some equivalence relation. So this might not look very informative, but let's now try this for, for these, the special case we're interested in when we do these pre-sheaves. Um, and, and so if one just parses out the definition, so what's happening here is we, we do the convolution of n of these pre-sheaves. And I, I'll t I promise here at the end that this has something to do with sequential rewrites. And so the trick is you effectively, so the D1 was a home functor here. You, you take, uh, HN was our, you know, horizontal composition, n fold. Um, so the trick is that this Cohen formula, if you parse it out, produces diagrams of the shape. You have a sequence of rewrites and then a mediating cell at the bottom. And so with this, you can test whether um, getting from here to here, the blue guy with the rule R, is possible through an n-step sequence with these uh, pre-sheaves. So it's almost what we want, only that at the foot, there's sort of this, I mean, this, we would like to get rid of the sigma, then it would really look like rewriting sequence. So uh, we can look at what it means, this equivalence relation, if we parse that out. So there's an, a way of sort of uh, repartitioning some content at the foot of this diagram into the little triangles. It's still not quite what we want. It's still, I mean, even if we now put in the special case of these Yoneda distribution pre-sheaves, you see the top looks a little bit like a sequence of rewrites, um, but, but there's still sort of this obstacle at the bottom. And so it took us a while to figure out how to mediate that. And it turns out, and, and I, I don't know, maybe this is independently interesting, that um, all of this will lead to a calculus where you have double categories where certain functors are endowed with vibrational properties. And so maybe just to recap, what's a Grotendieck vibration? Um, so, well, actually, Grotendieck op vibration. So it's a way you have two categories. One's called the fiber, one's called the base, E and B. Um, and, and the idea is that you are able to lift um, morphisms in the base against, uh, in this case, morphisms from the, from the domain, um, I mean, image of the element in the fiber. So that is, that is a, a well-known structure. It's again one of these universal constructions where you are unique up to isomorphism. And so it turns out the variant we need for our situation is a slight modification called a street of vibration, where the only difference to Grotendieck is that you, I mean, you cannot directly lift, you can only lift up to a small is mediating isomorphism in the base. Otherwise, it looks pretty similar to Grotendieck. Um, and I just mention this here because maybe later in the talk, just for the comparison, there's a variant of this we need, especially for this case of Artemi, um, called a multi-op vibration. So now the lifts are no, young, I mean, they need not exist and they might not be uh, unique. So, I mean, there might be many inequivalent ones. Um, what this wild diagram says is essentially that whenever you find two lifts that lift in the same splitting in the base, then they need to be isomorphic. And, and finally, there's a very Baroque one. Unfortunately, one needs for the most general case of writing called residual multi op vibration. But OK, I mean, it is just like an even further generalization where it looks a bit like a marriage of street and multi, but where, where the little mediating morphisms in the base are no longer even isomorphisms. So, I mean, OK. And now, for all of these constructions, um, because now we are thinking, we want to formalize it, but we also want to think about how doing algorithms with it. And there's this idea in vibration theory that you can, if you have these constructions which are unique only up to ISO, or families where elements are unique only up to ISO, then you can fix what's called a cleavage. So it's a choice for each lift, you, you, you pick one representative. Um, so that's, that's a well-known construction. And we are, assume from now on we, we, we are able to do this. Okay. And then, and then really here, here comes the point where, where we can make contact with computations. So it turns out that this um, horizontal composition functor 
in all of the cases we know where we can do this compositional writing theory, um, has this nice property that it is a street of vibration. And in particular, one case, I mean, you could call it globular street of vibration, where this mediating isomorphism is just a globular cell and not like a generic two cell, which just means in diagrams like so, when you have exactly the situation we had for this current, that you have a cell which uh, mediates between a horizontal composition of two arrows and an arrow at the bottom, then you can split it into two adjacent uh, two cells and a mediating, I mean, this sort of globular, this little globular cell, um, which is an isomorphism. And it turns out by induction, because we had this presentation, these HN also are all street op vibrations. So, so that's useful because now we can, ah, and sorry, and, and I need one more construction, apologies, um, so-called multi-sum. Um, multi-sum is essentially uh, a way of listing partial overlaps, if you will. Uh, again, it's universal construction up to isomorphism for which one can fix the cleavage. But okay, that's right. And so uh, it turns out that um, all of these cases have multi-sums. In particular, also the source and target functors have one extra property, namely the source functors in all of the examples we know are multi-op vibrations. And I mean, it really just means that we can vertically split a cell um, along a factorization of the horizontal source. And for the target functor, it's a slightly more complex situation in general that you can split the cells along uh, uh, a factorization of the target, but I mean modulo a residue. And so these are now really all the ingredients we need. And now we can indeed discover that for this situation, I mean, our double cut groups have a, this extra structure, and now we can do something with this cohen. So, so here's again this cohen. Um, and now we see that because the HN are street op vibrations, we can do something with this diagram. Namely, we can universally split it using the op vibration property, like so. But I mean, this configuration turns out is then equivalent by this equivalence of the cohen to one of the shape we want, exactly one which has these uh, n steps in a sequence and just uh, an isomorphism at the bottom. So this is now exactly the thing we want. And moreover, because this is an equivalence relation, we will effectively be counting such shapes modulo exactly this kind of equivalence we wanted to quotient out. So, so, th so that is now of the exact right shape. Um, and what remains of the equivalence if you go to a representation where you just have these sort of cat ear type diagrams, is just a degree of freedom which is exactly by, by these uh, essential isomorphisms. And it turns out now, if we, if we take um, uh, n different rules and we produce a co-end, then this is indeed exactly counting sequences of n steps of free writing, modulo these spurious degrees of freedom in, in universal isomorphisms. So that is the first good news. Um, but now, um, so the, the, the other point is that we wanted to categorify um, matrices with non-negative integer coefficients. So if that is the case, we must make sure that in particular the convolution product of two and then with a third needs to be isomorphic, the set of elements we produce for each R to the other order of composition, because otherwise we cannot, we cannot recover something like a, which is on, on the, on the non-categorified version, a product of, of matrices with these coefficients. And so that is um, indeed also reliant on all of these, actually only on the street of vibration structures. You can show, if you explicitly compute the, the, the composition, um, you first of all get a set which is quotiented by two equivalence relations, one on sort of the lower part with these V splittings and one also on the W splittings. Um, and it turns out you can use exactly these op vibration properties repeatedly to wrangle down one such diagram at the top all the way to one of this sort of cat ear type shape. And in, in particular, you can, um, you can also show that sort of the action of these re remaining globular isomorphisms can be emulated by um, applying again op vibrations and these, these two equivalence relations. So all together, I mean, uh, again, of course, quite a lot of details, but, but the main point is that you can show that actually the, the composition of F3 with the um, com convolution probe F2 and F1 uh, on any, on a evaluated on an, a rule R is isomorphic as a set to um, the shape which you would get from the triple convolution product. So it's very interesting that at this level of categorification, you find uh, NRE products that faithfully emulate these piecewise compositions. So that, that 
is, is a nice structure, and, and this ensures that this really categorifies these matrices, uh, these linear operators with non-negative integer coefficients. Okay, and uh, okay, I'm actually faster than I thought. Uh, and then, and then the end of the day, um, the sort of the, the, the highest level of, of structure we wanted to discover is this rule algebra. So the idea is that um, intuitively, if you rewrite um, just as with the set rewriting, one can imagine that you can, without acting on a particular set, you can imagine how rewriting steps could in principle interact. I mean, it's not hard to think if you do the set element takeouts and put-ins that you can list essentially without acting on a particular set the possible interactions. And so on the categorified level, we want to produce um, basically a categorification of the structure coefficients of an algebra, which I call rule algebra. Um, and it'll work by, for example, looking at the, the pairwise convolution product and then expressing it as um, uh, disjoint union over other, so, so sum of representables, if you will, of pre-sheaves. And here you see that this structure now uses exactly all of these other, so the multi-sum, the multi op vibration, and the residual multi op vibration structures, which we have for, for these kind of writing theories. And so, so the idea is that whenever you have such a sequence of two steps, um, what this multi-sum allows is you to, to, to look at essentially in which way the two rules overlapped. That's what this multi-sum computes. Um, and then you can use this residual multi-op vibration structure to split along this level of the... I mean, you cannot quite get split at the level of the multi-sum element because of this residual uh, structure. And then you use the multi-op vibration to the other side to split like so. And finally, you arrive at a configuration which now, I mean, by simply composing out the cells at the bottom. So the top thing is parametrized by a multi-sum element, a residue, and, and these lifts. And the bottom thing is just a regular um, uh, two-cell. And so in this way, each configuration, each class in, in the convolution product can be uniquely characterized by this triple of data um, colored here. And also, conversely, if you if you start from the other side of the equation, if you give me uh, one such configuration, I can produce for you the generic element in this convolution product, uh, I mean, a representative in the convolution product. So, okay. And now, um, sort of, just as with the convolution product, one can now check that there is a certain notion of associativity, of weak associativity for, for, for this you know, new operation, the, the bullet dot. Um, and the trick here is, again, to, to pass through um, a layer where you use a triple convolution product. I mean, we know that we, um, the triple convolution product is isomorphic, I mean, each set, um, to the pairwise convolution product, of which we know how to classify it. And, and so in this way, we can show a chain of isomorphisms that uh, produces us in the end that indeed um, the, these bullet dot operations are associative, weakly associative. Okay. And here is now the promised example, and I think I have a bit of time to go into this, so that my question is whether one can enlarge this. So here's this, um, because now we have everything in place. So we now know that if we want to list um, the contributions to a sequential composition of rules, all we have to do is build these diagrams. We, we list the multisums, we list these liftings to both sides. I mean, we need to know how to do it. But um, essentially, we will get representatives of compositions, and the count is exactly the number of ways overall to rewrite. And then if you look at uh, the foot of each diagram, you see what is the overall effect. Um, and in this way, you can classify. And, and, and you see that in Artemis school, when you um, clone a vertex and then link the two copies, then there is one option of composition which is sketched here, where you simply run these rules in parallel and they do not interact at all. That is always one possibility. And that is uh, the first contribution. Then there is a way, so, so now you can overlap. So off the first rule, you can pick one of the two vertices with a second to attack. Um, and when you do that, um, effectively this, uh, this, um, this multi-op vibration structure is that once you clone, you have to redistribute uh, the, the edges. Here there's only one edge after the first step, which you can redistribute. So there's two options per, um, per uh, uh, overlap. So overall, we have one option which is not interact at all, and then four options, I mean, two each per 
possible vertex overlap for, for the other um, diagram. And it, it, indeed, then one, if one analyzes it, one finds that there is a combinatorial structure here, namely, I mean, not very deep, of course, but that you get the rule where you produce eventually a chain of new edges. You can get that twice. I mean, there's, there's a way of uh, reproducing that. And so, I mean, this is just showing one composite. And um, of course, then if you do, let's say, 10, um, these combinatorial factors get much more interesting. And I should also say that there is a team at Topos Institute currently implementing these through compositions, um, I mean, from the categorical formalism. And presumably, we can do these calculations on a computer also, because this is, of course, by hand. OK. And OK. And um, yes, so, so and finally now, um, just to show that we can indeed now start computing, um, there was this idea that these operators somehow associated to a rule acting on a vector space over states, so isomorphism classes. You should be able to compute that by first representing the state as acting with the generator of that object on some vacuum configuration. And then what we have here is a product of this linear operator, so we know intuitively now we can apply this convolution product calculation. And if you want to ask the question, is it possible to reach to an object y, we can compute this combination here. And you see, indeed, it, it precisely quotients out, so um, doing basically this, this uh, empty object was strict initial, so there are some manipulations one can do, and one arrives exactly at shapes what we wanted in the first place, that we, we do not count spurious isomorphisms. So in, in, in this case, uh, span isomorphisms. And that is what makes us a finite non-negative integer coefficients, provided all of the objects were, were finite, which they are in practice. Okay, and just to conclude, so there's uh, this one calculation where now really, I mean, I wouldn't know how to do that without this current calculus, and um, so that was a very nice surprise because there is sometimes in combinatorics also this question just how many ways there are to rewrite, not, not which details, but I mean just how many ways can you reach new objects. And now we have the language for, for computing that also in the category theory, we can simply take a current over, uh, over the possible outcome objects. And if one then parses out all the details um, of these equivalences, you, you get precisely what, what, I mean, intuitively you wanted from the start, that, that you can, that each contribution will only be per isomorphism class of y's, because you have this equivalence which factors out not only isomorphisms in y, but also the induced isomorphisms in, in the mediating rules. And so, so this thing is now precisely giving us, if we count now, cardinal, if we take the cardinality of that set, it'll give us a non-negative integer, for, I mean, again, for finite objects everywhere, um, while in principle, without that equivalence relation, that would be an infinite set. So, um, so that, that seems promising, and, um, and we are only at the beginning here. We, we will hopefully submit uh, a paper to a computer science conference about this in the in end of January, which we make available in archive. And I just wanted to conclude by saying we, we won the funding for this project I spoke about last year, which is about um, precisely a, a large collaboration on formalizing uh, concepts in category, in particular for rewriting theory. And uh, if you are interested, we will start in March next year. We will have a web page where we have something like a Wikipedia with formalized content, uh, which will be a co collaborative project. And there we will, of course, eventually also reproduce all of these concepts um, and sort of like an NLAB with formal proof assistance enabled. Uh, yes, and so with that, um, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's my handwriting. <laughs> Sorry. Dot <coughs> wiki at here? Yeah. Uh, I'll check it maybe and then. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it should work. But, yeah. Maybe it's just correct.wiki because maybe there's some HTTP something. Yeah. You are citing Artemi Kiselev uh, contribution? Yes. Can you give some more? Ah, yes, because uh, I mean, it is. Um, let me go back. Yes. Here. Because I mean, so when, by the time Artemi gave that talk, um, he had a nice explanation of 
you know, the algorithm, how to compute graphs in this uh, calculus. And it was funny because at the time we didn't know how to do, because you see the rule which you need to read from right to left needs to clone a vertex. And interestingly, that was a gap in the literature. It was not possible. I mean, it was not described how, how do you do this categorically. And so it was our motivation to show that, well, it's perfectly well possible. And it, indeed, exactly this weird effect that if you clone <coughs> the vertex at which there are incident edges, um, the possibilities you have up to universal isomorphism is exactly redistributing these edges to the new clones such that the overall number of edges um, is the same as before. And so, so that was one of these motivating examples which drove us into, because then after a while you find that if you don't use these vibrational properties then the theory how to show composition becomes simply uh, intractable. So it drove us in this direction of sort of first trying to formalize what are these double cells before trying to go into that level of detail and, and that was extremely was extremely useful so if I may add the collegial opinion uh, I'm afraid everything is stolen from Maxim Kansic oh okay <laughs> including the no, oh, I, and I'm sorry yes of course yeah because you were talking about yeah Actually, I have a maybe kind of suggestion. Mm -hmm. As we look, there is now big development in integra integrability and probability series, like that's mm -hmm. that process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's also some kind of like rewriting, more or less. Ah. And there is some algebra, some commutative, commutative stuff. And interesting. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, you know, this TASEP. Yes, yes, yes. I think this thing where you jump on a chain and you can jump off and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the sort of exclusion, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, no, and, and I mean then maybe, that's the thing, I mean here we only say for generic, uh, I mean, but I mean if you fix also on top your input graph, like you do there, I imagine you have this chain and then one might, I mean, it just feels nice that you can give a formal definition of this before you do any by hand calculation. That for us it was because we want to formalize this also and also do understand kind of all this replacement is kind of general computability. Yeah. Yes. And yes. but on computability, it's not only ex people with interest only existence, you just can number of ways. Exactly. Exactly. And and that is where and you need that for a lot of things, but then. It turns out that many algorithms that are around are actually, <laughs> I mean, there's gaps because, I mean, nobody can preview. I mean, normally they're checked for acting on a particular input graph and then, I mean, if that works, it's fine. Uh, this, this adds a new layer of being able to verify these algorithms because, uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, with respect to Tasep and so on, um, you, you may want to follow the number of particles that you jump. Mm. And this could be something which could be not bounded a priori. Yes. Is it a parameter that you can follow with your approach? That's a good question. I imagine. You mean that when you only when you basically look at all possible states that have, let's say, two excitations? Yeah. Yeah. So that is a very interesting question. I think that is exactly where you touch on the defi well definedness of these species, which a priori can handle that situation. And I guess you want to put some sort of equivalence by number of excitations so that you get countable. Mm. Yeah, I would. I mean, again, like I'm hesitating because it's exactly this moment where you will really enter the full pre sheaf calculus and it's no longer the situation where you're a priori guaranteed that the number of events will be finite. And then the question is whether it's well defined. So. Well, uh, in general, uh, it's restricted by the size of the, the number. Ah, you have a size? Okay, I thought it was... Oh, so, so this will be bonded, but when you increase the size, then this parameter will not be bonded. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I'm not sure if you should say that it is bonded or not, but... I mean, here, I mean, when I say I get finite integers, that was for finitary structures, which we are normally interested in, I guess. But nobody prohibits you from experimenting with, uh, I mean, the calculus itself, the logic, how things can overlap remains. I mean, that is the only point is whether you have a finite multi-sum to play with, because you need at some point to list the number of overlaps. And if that is, but I, I imagine that is w maybe worth a try, yes. And, and for the website, you have to drop the www, ah, and okay. then it works. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's still not, I mean, it'll be fully functional in, in March and we will have like an online, what's nice about it is we will have an online editor where you can run Coq directly in the browser and, and so for that we are still working on the internals. <laughs> so, but that'll be up in March, I think. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you.